There are some applications, however, becoming standard. For example, some of you are familiar with the term MBR, membrane bioreactors, which are used in wastewater treatment in municipal wastewater, a lot here in Korea, but all around the world. In Europe, membrane reactors, and particularly a certain specific kind of membrane bioreactors, we will call immerse membrane reactors, the acronym of MBR, are uh, considered what we call a BAT, Best Available Technology. So they are very becoming very popular and very standardized. However, we will also discuss of many other very important, interesting uh, membrane reactors not yet standardized. In uh, particular, in you know, petrochemical industry, in traditional uh, chemical reaction, still uh, work has to be done for reasons that are not really related to the level of the technology, are more related to boundary condition, to the, the difficulty to introduce new technology in existing system already, but more and more they are becoming quite interesting and attractive. And we already discussed that membrane reactors have a lot of interesting uh, uh, performance related to the process intensification. You will see some numbers, you know, the, the volume of uh, reactors of, uh, when combined with membrane system can be reduced by order of magnitude. You can make big reactors becoming much smaller. The degree of conversion, the productivity of the system is increasing significantly, et cetera, et cetera. And more and more than these things are becoming important, we will have more application and more uh, uh, industrial potentiality. Basically, membrane reactors are also very much related to the problem of catalysis. And today, when you are studying a new catalyst, or when you are analyzing old catalysts and all not working at the best, in the best way, uh, people are also looking more and more to utilize catalysts in a different design, or what we call catalyst design. You can utilize a catalyst that for some reason uh, was uh, easy fouling, for example, or uh, low performance uh, and not, not stable, and biocatalyst as enzyme. If you redesign the utilization of your catalyst, combining uh, the operation of this catalyst with membrane system, you can have significant improvement. Typical case is the situation of biocatalyst and enzyme. Enzymes are very important. We are full, or we are nicely living because we have a lot of enzyme working in our body. All of them are bounded, they are compartmentalized in a membrane system. And at industrial level, if you want to use a catalyst in a decent performance for a long, long time of operation, etc., you have to combine this catalyst with the membrane system. So we have, for example, catalytic membranes, which are part of uh, bioreactors, obviously. So the problem in general, however, this is not only for enzyme. Enzyme has been the first case, because we will see that uh, lifetime of a biocatalyst as an enzyme can improve significantly when instead of being utilized a free in solution in homogeneous system, it is going to be utilized, immobilized in a membrane system. So immobilization is a way to improve the performance and eventually to control the fouling, degradation, the decay, etc., etc. So there is a lot of biocatalysts. But uh, the problem of uh, catalysis that my, uh, today is more and more, which is in general a very big, uh, interesting problem, is more and more related also to membrane engineering in general because there is a lot of uh, interaction and uh, way to improve the catalyst performance to the point that we call uh, catalyst design the realization, new catalyst design, the realization of catalytic membrane system, catalytic uh, bioreactor, etc. Et uh, so membrane can just give a, a quite significant improvement to this uh, uh, system. Uh, what is membranes now we know very well, we learn already different times, and also we remember that we have been using 
many different kinds of membranes, all of them can be utilized uh, as uh, in membranes in reactor system as in reverse osmosis is in ultrafiltration. That means we will use porous membranes and dense membranes. They will be polymeric, they will be inorganic, they will be metal, etc. All of these can be part of a membrane reactor system. So it's just an integration of the system. And basically what is a membrane reactor? Membrane reactors is uh, one of the most interesting, easy example of what we call multifunctional reactors in which basically it's possible to carry out in parallel a reaction and in separation in the same vessel in the same time. Uh, I was mentioning already some time that uh, this is one of the first easy, relatively easy, not easy for us, uh, easy for uh, trying to reproduce what nature is doing. In nature, oh, most of the membrane system are much more than uh, membrane reactors. It's not only two functions that are combined. In this case, here we can combine separation and chemical conversion. In nature, there's much more than this. Many more chemical conversion can take place in a single step. Uh, other kind of function can, be, can also take place. Energy transfer or uh, information transfer, etc. But this is the easiest case of a system in which we can have separation and chemical conversion. And already this can be utilized in a very large variety of different modes. As you can see here, what we have basically, we can have uh, in, in this case are uh, tube in tube. We can have a system which is uh, a tubular system which is, uh, uh, can have some catalytic effect by itself or can uh, compartmentalize this uh, catalyst. And for example, this system can be a, a membrane by or palladium, so the hydrogen can permeate across. And the, the catalyst in this case is outside in the second part. So you can have uh, some a feed which is entering. Some chemical reaction is taking place in this uh, catalytic uh, system. For example, producing uh, hydrogen. That can be a reaction of steam reforming or uh, any other reaction which hydrogen is going to be produced, which is a real case. And what is happening here is that uh, during uh, the reaction, the hydrogen that you produce will permeate across these membranes. We learned last time that uh, we have a system as palladium in which only hydrogen is going through. So that means that during this reaction, the system is producing one of the product, the hydrogen, which is continuously removed in the system in, in across these membranes. That means, first of all, this system will never approach equilibrium. Most part of no chemical reaction are just uh, approaching an equilibrium in general, and so the, no, nothing more is going to be produced. Not in this case. You can remove continuously from the system one of the products, and so the system will become irreversible. So the productivity is approaching 100%. You can convert all your system. And more than this. But that's typical, one of the, uh, that was one of the first uh, motivation for realizing uh, membrane reactors. To be able to remove, uh, during the reaction, one of the <coughs> products. Today you will see we, uh, it's much more than this, but that's a typical case. So in this case, we have a catalyst, and this, uh, this feed is just be transformed in some products. One of the products, only one in this case, if this is palladium, hydrogen, is going across. So at the end you will have just a, a permate, which is a hydrogen purified already, very, very uh, pure. Quite interesting for different reasons, and that is one of the real case we will discuss a little bit. Now if you make a comparison, which are the advantages of this kind of system where the chemical conversion and uh, the separation take place, you have basically, uh, in general, uh, lower energy requirement in the sense, for example, that we just separate continuously. We increase productivity just because we are removing one of the product. We never approach the equilibrium, basically. As, uh, as all the membrane system, if we have to increase or decrease uh, the size of the system, etc., easy scale up. 
scale down and scale up. We can operate in a large stream, but we can also operate in very small streams. Some of the uh, membrane reactors are today used in the pharmaceutical industry or in regenerative medicine, etc., for scaling down to make a very, very small system. Uh, we can just reduce the formation of byproducts because if you remove uh, immediately and uh, continuously the product from the reaction uh, system, the possibility of the side reaction or uh, any other byproduct, etc., is much more limited and eventually can be controlled. If you know how, to, if you know the mechanism, you know that when you have a chemical conversion, remember, and you want to control it, it's not easy at all. That is one of the business of uh, not membrane engineers but the chemical engineers in general. And I was always mentioning to make clear that when you convert C, you know, carbon C plus uh, oxygen for making CO2, people assume it's very easy. Now you have carbon, you have oxygen, you form a CO2, it's an, an easy, easy reaction. For transforming carbon plus oxygen in CO2, if you study the reaction mechanism, the different steps, there are 5,000 reactions taking place before carbon plus oxygen form CO2. And they are in between the reactants, single carbon and single oxygen, and the final one. And the possibility, or the, if you want to control uh, the, the quality of your combustion, this is the combustion process, and you have to know the kinetic mechanism. And you have to control the most part, at least the most significant of these 5,000, 4,000, when they are, which is not easy. Membrane system can help in uh, modify part of this uh, complicated uh, reaction mechanism and eventually to separate some of the chemical that are at the origin of byproducts, to control temperature variation, to avoid some side reaction that can, are not, that you don't want to have, or eventually, as in the case that we have been mentioning in, in crystallizers, to improve, to increase some uh, formation of some product at the end. When we have been discussing, remember, about the membrane, uh, the crystallizers, we mentioned the possibility to form some polymorph, the kind of chemical reaction in this case, was related to the fact that we have been able to control with the membranes the kinetics or the formation of some of the heterogeneous uh, nucleus that are going, are forming the metastable uh, step of the heterogeneous nucleation. And that is, is a kind in general the chemical reaction. The same story can happen here and you can control by product and avoid or eventually uh, induce if necessary. Uh, in some cases, you can uh, have the possibility to eat recovery. If this is an uh, exothermic reaction, during the process, it's much easier to recover some heat and eventually reusing this heat in some other part of the, the uh, reaction system. Uh, the system, as all membrane system, is quite compact, quite is modular, and uh, in Rule number one, this is an easy way to recycle the catalyst. Because in this case, you know, this is a typical system in which the catalyst is separate from the products at the end, in the, in the configuration we were showing you before. In many cases, it's interesting to reuse and to recover the catalyst for being reused again at the end. That's an easy way of doing it. This was, again, one of the motivations for doing this. Uh, as I was mentioning, initially, People working on the uh, um, catalytic membranes or the chemical reactors, uh, membrane reactors in general, were looking basically to two aspects. One was to remove continuously one of the product of the reaction, hydrogen or uh, water. In the other case, there is in the other case in, in exterification reaction in which you are producing normally during esterification, you produce water just because the interesting membranes with a very high selectivity for water exist, the same that you are using in eventually in reverse osmosis in nanofiltration, people were using the system to speed up to in, uh, improve the performance of esterification very easily, or the case of hydrogen I showed you before. And the other uh, uh, interest was to recover as much as possible the catalyst and uh, reusing the catalyst at the end of the operation, etc. But you can see here, there's much more than this. If you analyze one by one, 
we can have for sure the separation of the products from the reaction mixture, hydrogen, water, from the reaction mixture. There's a typical case already applied. But you can also have the separation of reactant from a mixed stream for introduction into the reactor. So you can also have feed with different components, and you can try to have only one of the components of the feed to be supplied in the, in the system where the reaction is taking place. That can be another possibility. You, have, you can have, in general, what we call a control addition of reactants, which this is quite interesting and important for in real life. If you have the possibility, normally, if you, you, have to con you, you are putting all of the reactants to, together and you follow the reaction. But if you have, the, and that is at the origin of different problem, what we call hot spots, sometimes you have much more, it initially there's much more reactants than necessary. So you can have uh, temperatures going higher, than, or you lose control of the system, hot spots that are typical. The same story we have with uh, when you take a medicine, just you have some effect, but initially when you make the, you know, the medicine you are high, you have some, uh, you don't like it. You have a strong uh, effect because it's too much. Slowly, the medicine will diffuse and everything is better, but initially it's not. Here is the same story, but if you have a membrane that will uh, diffuse in a controlled way, the reactants in the system of reaction, that can be much better. Not easy, but can be much better. Uh, you can have a system which non-dispersing phase contacting the, at the interface of uh, phase that don't mix the reaction can take place. That's quite interesting in some situation, which for example is uh, solvents that you don't like, and so you can try to operate at the interface. So we have a reaction at the, you know, at the interface or in the bulk phases. Segregation of a catalyst in the reactor is possible. Immobilization of a catalyst in a membrane, and that's what I was mentioning before, and that is particularly for biocatalysts where the problem of lifetime is very important. And uh, keep in mind that already now, the membrane in a membrane reactor is, uh, in the meantime, trying to realize more than one of these factions can be a system to separate, can be a system also to increase lifetime, can be a system in which you can just uh, separate and induce higher activity to the catalyst itself, etc., etc. So it's quite interesting that everything started only to for the separation and eventually to the recovery of the catalyst. Today, all these uh, different uh, options are present and they more than one can be present in the, in the same time. So the system can be quite complicated and quite uh, interesting. Uh, the configuration of the reaction can be again uh, traditional, uh, following the traditional one that you have in uh, the different separation system. You can have a system in which you can have just a reaction volume and we just uh, pressurize the system. Something is going across, we have a, a, a permate and the retentate, and uh, we can remove eventually the permate from the uh, permate side by a sweep gas that will uh, take all the stuff out. Uh, we can have uh, the system here in what is in a, that this kind of system is typical uh, complete steered, no, the equivalent of a steered system uh, basically, is a, a CSTR or uh, you can have a plug flow co-current or a plug flow counter-current. And remember, we, we discussed in the gas separation uh, the best way to have always uh, under control the driving force that is moving some products, some of the feed components across your membrane is working uh, in cross-flow. So this is the best way to keep control compared to the uh, co-current. Exactly the same concept can be transferred in just uh, the system where we have separation and the reaction in the meantime. So we will have a plug flow countercurrent or the plug flow co current uh, system, where in, the, in this case we have in one direction and the, and the same direction for feed and uh, permate, and here is just the opposite. Again, for what concern uh, the membrane that we are going to use, there are two different kinds of reactors and two different kinds of membranes. We can have a system in which the membranes is uh, inert, is not active uh, as, a, as a catalyst, for example. 
So the membranes act only as a separators. And the case I was showing you before when uh, I was uh, looking the first uh, annually and annually, the catalyst was uh, in between the two uh, tubes that we were using in the system. And the catalyst was nothing to do with the membrane itself. So in this case, we have inert membranes and uh, acting only as the separators and eventually combine with a catalytic bed, with a free dissolved bed, etc., in which the reaction takes place. And this was the, the first case I was showing before, if you remember, this typical case where the catalyst is totally outside and is not related really to the uh, membrane itself. It's that it's only compared, com, tim, com, com, anyway, <laughs> put in this way. The other case in which the membrane itself is a catalytic membrane. So the membrane, the reaction is taking place in the membrane phase, as in most of the cases uh, in our body. And in this case, uh, the catalyst is distributed in the membrane and the reaction takes place inside or the membrane surface. And this is um, one of the more uh, interesting one. And in some cases, uh, th this is also uh, many of these reactions in biological world, in biotechnology, and there are different advantages in doing this case related particularly to the functionality of the catalyst itself. For example, as I was mentioning before, for if, a, if uh, we are working with enzymes, lifetime of this enzyme can increase uh, significantly and becoming of interest for industrial application, which is not the case uh, normally. So we can uh, classify our membrane reactors in a different way, and uh, this classification is still very, uh, no, is not at steady state. Everybody is inventing new configuration, a uh, new, new term to identify the system, but basically you can uh, classify the membrane reactors as a function of this uh, material you are using, and you can have membranes which can be organic membranes and polymers in general, or inorganic. Ceramic membrane is very popular in some membrane reactors because when you operate in gas phase, temperature normally is high. Steam reforming, water gas shift, a reaction that normally run at uh, 400, 500 degrees centigrade, 600, 300, so polymers are not appropriate. In this case, uh, ceramics, this is one of the area where ceramics material will compete significantly and will be become predominant probably in uh, compared to polymeric membranes. And uh, eventually also metals, which have the same kind of properties. And uh, they can, the transport, the, the function of these uh, uh, reactors in this case can be different and is related to the function of the membrane. So you can have uh, a membrane reactors in which the function of the membrane is to operate as a distributor to diffuse the reactants in the reaction zone or to uh, extraction, to extract something, or as a, just as a contactors. So membrane contactor is the case in which you don't have any mixing, but you can try to optimize this uh, chemical reaction at the interface between two different phases. And uh, you can have uh, inert system where uh, very different kind of configuration most of the configuration which already exists in uh, chemical reactors. You can have a fixed bed, a free design bed. You can have a catalyst which is uh, working in homogeneous system or heterogeneous system. Uh, you can have a catalyst which can be biological, can be enzyme or microorganism, the full cell with all the microorganisms that are inside, or non-biological, metals, oxide, every, every kind of catalyst that uh, you can imagine. As was mentioned, the interest uh, when everything started was basically the recovery and the catalysts are expensive. And sometimes on one side they're expensive, on the other side they are quite polluting. They are metals. And so you are not supposed uh, to you know, discharge easily the catalyst when they stop operation, etc. So the possibility to have uh, catalyst uh, reuse being facilitated is quite interesting and that was one of the first uh, motivation, reuse and recovery as much as possible. Uh, moreover, I was mentioning particularly with bio catalyst, you can increase stability, but not only with bio, because sometimes just 
having the possibility to control the mechanism of reaction and avoiding some of the side reaction inducing the formation of some poisoning, uh, carbon, etc. This is also quite interesting. And in general, you have the immobilization, the entrapment of your catalyst in the functional structure of the, uh, the, uh, the membrane itself is uh, completely changing, in some case, the way in which the catalyst itself is working. The, from this point, catalyst design is becoming interesting based on membranes because if you understand very well what the catalyst, how the catalyst is working, you can induce improving the performance or you can uh, decrease uh, some activity and emphasize some other one. Typical example you can see here, for example, when you have uh, uh, a catalyst in which there is a transition state, the different uh, uh, metals, electrons in the system having, playing a role, uh, you can have a situation in which you can uh, emphasize uh, electronic interaction, or can there can be the strong interaction or weak interaction, and you can just uh, facilitate or avoid this kind of phenomena. Uh, and in general, that can be you can control the microenvironment in which your catalyst is going to operate. So you can emphasize uh, oxidation and or reaction or the re reduction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you will see some example that on which we have been working with polyoxymetallate, for example, in which if you know what has to be done, if you want to have a catalyst that has to have a strong electronic interaction and no uh, hydrophilic, no 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 water interaction you can decide which kind of uh, environment, which kind of membranes is more appropriate for this kind of reaction. And uh, in the meantime, you can just try to realize system in which the uh, interaction between the reactant and the catalyst can be quite uh, well done, well designed. In a typical case, you can see that you can have uh, reactants on one side of your uh, membranes, A and B, and everything is in the C and D is what is happening in the, in the membrane itself, and we can have just uh, two different phases in contact in, the, in which this transfer of one reactance to the, as a product can be very well controlled. Remember that one of the requests of process intensification is just to have any chemicals uh, running uh, always under the same driving force and if possible at the interface, because that's the best way to control all the, the kind of phenomena that can have an influence on the catalyst function. Uh, mentioning what we already uh, mentioned, but that to emphasize, retaining a recycle of the catalyst, that means you know, the heterogenization of the catalyst in the membrane itself, becoming a catalytic membrane system is one of these uh, important functions. And because that is uh, the heterogenization of the catalyst is uh, quite interesting, this uh, catalyst design, and uh, in which you can basically have the mobilization quite different from what is done normally in, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in pellets, in blades, etc., but at molecular or atomic level. And that's exactly what uh, is more and more necessary today. Uh, to justify why uh, the, all these things, which in principle are interesting, can be really realized. If you go in literature, you can check already, I was mentioned before, not big application yet on large scale, but a lot of uh, check and a lot of uh, studies are in progress showing uh, what can be done and slowly they will become uh, real. So there are different examples of reaction in which things are moving. This one is a coupling of the photocatalysis by titanium dioxide, which is a typical photocatalyst, and membrane process in the water purification, for example, in the 4 nitrophenol mineralization. And that is the kind of reaction in which basically you can uh, optimize uh, the functionality of titanium uh, dioxide, which has been immobilized in uh, PSF uh, membrane, which is becoming a catalytic active membrane. This is the work done, for example, in our university. And uh, there's uh, this system in which you can uh, uh, increase the efficiency compared to the traditional way in which titanium dioxide was utilized in, in, uh, in, uh, in powder system, etc., you can have a much better stability, reuse of the catalyst, and uh, the comparison is quite uh, interesting. 
and the performance today are becoming of interest. If you go on the web and you will find, for example, I was mentioning already, a project called Nowadex, is a big European program, you will find that today the same concept is utilized to prepare ultrafiltration membranes charged with uh, titanium dioxide and for optimization of the pretreatment in the salination. So before going arriving to the reverse osmosis membranes, you have ultrafiltration of the feed in which the titanium dioxide well distributed in uh, your uh, ultrafiltration membrane, polyether sulfone, PES membrane, and titanium dioxide are working. So that's an interesting uh, no, extrapolation. This work was uh, 2002, but today in Europe there is uh, the same experience is being utilized for much more than this. And basically you have uh, selective removal of the products from the reaction mixture to prevent consecutive reaction to circumvent the limitation by the equilibrium, etc. in dead regeneration, esterification, and so on. You can have a selective supply of reactants to reduce the number of process that required. For example, you can integrate oxygen separation for partial oxidation and or to influence the selectivity on the reaction. So the separation function is also a way, if you well control some of these separation, you can enhance selectivity and enhance productivity of your system. This is another typical example. Uh, if, you have, if you want to improve the selectivity in the extraction of a primary product, this is ESOC 10, in a zeolite membrane reactor, so respect to a conventional fixed bed reactors, that is basically is a reaction related to the oligo oligomerization of uh, isobutane, you can see here. In uh, the traditional uh, reactors, this is typical uh, plot, and that's what you can have in a zeolite membrane reactors. Much, much uh, higher in terms of uh, the isobutane conversion and the yield of your reaction just combining this, uh, the, the system through this uh, zeolite uh, system. And uh, so the, the way to uh, improve the selectivity is another possibility. That is the increase in the reaction yield respect of the traditional one, and by, in this case, by removal of the one product. Is the isobutane, the hydrogenation in extractor type uh, reactors. This is a compound where basically you produce hydrogen, and if you can just uh, remove the hydrogen, the system has, uh, will never approach and you are increasing significantly the degree of conversion, basically the productivity of the system. And in this case, you can see here that uh, you, can, you can have this uh, traditional system, it's uh, number three, and thermodynamic equilibrium in conventional reactors down here, and that's what you can have with uh, zeolite membranes or with uh, palladium membranes. In both cases, these are membranes where you can separate in uh, selectively the hydrogen is formed during the reaction. And uh, the variation are it's not a uh, few percent, but are quite, quite interesting. From three to two, you see that it was normally around a factor of 10, you can you go up to factor of 60. So these the term are quite interesting. And uh, the, in some case, that is also useful to uh, make, a, to have comments on this that uh, you can do also trying to predict the performance. Not easy. You can predict, you make the modeling, and the modeling is uh, this uh, plot down here or down here. So and we are very good expert in uh, chemical engineer that can try to predict, but is much better than the when no membranes is present, but you don't have uh, easily a good agreement between the simulation, the modeling, and the experimental results. And in some, except in some uh, area at a very low counter current sweep, that means in some uh, condition or something is uh, reasonable, the decent, but in when you are increasing the degree of conversion, etc., you can see the discrepancy between uh, the simulation, the, the prediction, and the experimental results uh, is significant. That means this system needs a lot of work to be done. And that is related to the quality of your membranes, to the performance of the membrane. You assume some separation that you cannot obtain at the level you are supposed to have, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, that's another case interesting because uh, it's just offering the possibility to describe what is mixed oxide membrane. This is a very interesting um, area. I was mentioning, and we will, if we have time, we will discuss a little bit this uh, perovskite-like. Uh, membranes. This is perovskite, like oxide, 
And this, uh, no, this kind of compounds is a mixture of different kind of metal oxide. It's interesting because uh, the transport mechanism in this kind of material has nothing to do on what we have been discussing until now. Normally, we have been telling in a liquid phase, in gas phase, we don't want to have crystals because crystals are a barrier to the transfer of everything. So no permeation in a crystal, it's just a big barrier, except when you have this kind of materials. In this material, these are crystalline phase, but in this crystal, you can find a lot of defects. And th this defect can be vacancy of something, for example, oxygen, or a vacancy of uh, other compounds, or eventually intrusion. Add them up. You can have one more metal in the, uh, in the crystalline uh, system. Uh, these defects can be utilized for separation. In perovskite, this is the case. In perovskite, you can have a 100% selective transfer of oxygen across a perovskite membranes uh, through the vacancy, the defect, the vacancy of in the, in the, the network of your crystal, there is some uh, deficiency of oxygen and oxygen can jump from one defect to the other. And if you are increase a significant number of uh, vacancy, you can have significant transfer across. Keep in mind, the only trouble is that this kind of phenomena is taking place normally at very high temperature. In the existing perovskite today, the kind of operation uh, in some cases 800 degrees centigrade, 700. However, there's a lot of money. All the big petrochemical company are working together. They made big consortium to realize this kind of uh, membranes and to operate this kind of membrane in very important reaction as steam reforming, for example. Because of steam reforming, you have to transform your uh, methane, your gas, in uh, thin gas, and you have to, expel. doing this, you have to extract oxygen from air. And that's the real, real cost. Because if you're using cryogenic, you have to liquefy, distillate, and having gas reacting with the oxygen, etc. Significant cost. If you take a tube of perovskite at, in, uh, in organic membranes, in principle, the air that is uh, around, you can move the oxygen from the air, you can have an extraction, in the methane is running inside the tube, oxygen is going across, and this methane is entering, and zinc gas is going out. And that is uh, quite interesting, and you can decrease the running cost of the system of uh, 30, 40, 50% in real life, uh, well, the only trouble, you have to operate at very high temperatures today. However, this is an interesting uh, area of, for future uh, investigation because in other case, people know. This typical case is superconductivity. Years ago, superconductivity, very interesting, and, uh, but not easy to realize because all the superconductivity metals, mixture of, ox of uh, oxide, etc., the same story, were uh, having this property of superconductivity at very low temperature, minus uh, 80, minus uh, 200. And there's no way to realize, to take opportunity of the superconductivity in real life. Today, if you go in China, there are trains running on this uh, superconductivity concept, now this uh, magnetic levitation train. They are building 16,000 kilometers of train using supermagnetic, uh, uh, this uh, kind of phenomena, the superconductivity, because People have been able uh, to have the same with new materials, the same kind of phenomena, not a minus under 80, but at uh, room temperature or the descent temperature. Maybe that uh, the same kind of phenomena will take place shortly on perovskite. In this case, this will become one of the most interesting in gas separation and conversion. This typical case, the order of magnitude of the project in progress here are in one case is about uh, 200 million dollars. It's one of the consortium where all these uh, European company and some South Africa are working together. Another one is in the Department of Energy, the United States, with the Shell and BP, etc. And uh, that you know, the oxygen can diffuse through the membrane, generate at the surface very active selective oxygen entities that give high yield that molecular oxygen. That's something similar to what we have been uh, mentioning in the case of hydrogen in the palladium, basically. Okay, uh, this is the structure of these uh, perovskites, typical, and you can see that is the uh, one, the vacancy I was mentioned before, you are supposed to have an oxygen here, there's no oxygen, 
So the system has to be as different uh, structure because some of these uh, gallium, you, know, you have to combine the, el the electron neutrality has to be always uh, well verified. But when you have this, ox this uh, vacancy, oxygen can only jump from another vacancy, or from outside eventually, but moving through the defects. And if there are many defects, so that can be 100% selective only for oxygen and so the very same case of uh, hydrogen I was mentioning before. So the perovskites are quite interesting, not only for the possible application in Cetreta, but also for the fundamental function of fast oxygen transport in solid state ionic. That means that uh, why only oxygen? In perspective, you can try to design one of these material for, uh, for example, for lithium. One of the big problems we have today in lithium battery is that uh, we don't have uh, still m very efficient uh, separators between the anodic and cathodic compartment of the lithium battery. In, uh, we have to move lithium ions. And sometimes you can have explosion, etc., related to this kind of problem. If tomorrow some of you will be able to design a perovskite, with the defect for lithium, with lithium ions, the problem of lithium battery will, make, will be solved. Not easy, but that can be, and if it exists for oxygen, in principle, why not for some other uh, uh, system? Hydrogen and lithium, etc., etc. The immigration ions within perovskite light take place along the edge of the BO6 octahedron and, the, and the, all the vacancy which exist around the system. And uh, th that is the case I was mentioning before, the reforming, that is a case of uh, CO2 plus, plus hydrogen, or the, the, you have the um, extraction of hydrogen on one side, and the, you supply with uh, methane, and you have this, uh, the, the reaction, and the oxygen has to be extracted uh, somewhat from here, and that is from air, basically, but only oxygen is going through. You have the reforming, and you form the syn gas, etc., etc. And that is one of the reactions uh, more investigated today. We are working, we have a project only for working on this kind of system and trying to realize this kind of reactors in the lab scale, but you can design a new gas station, if you can do this in the, on the road, for supplying uh, methane to the car and on board, and today already they are able to do it, and coming out with uh, the hydrogen for your uh, fuel cell, and that means to have an uh, electrical engine uh, in, uh, installed on your car. And that can be one of the ways of doing all in a membrane system. Uh, it's quite interesting, uh, you will see, we will define some, uh, some uh, uh, specific parameters because in some cases you can uh, control reaction volume by realizing, uh, as uh, what we were telling before, two a ideal contacting zone between two immiscible uh, phases. And that's what is called normally phase transfer catalysis. That's also quite interesting, and that's one way of doing. You can, for example, immobilize uh, lipase or some enzyme in some uh, uh, polymeric membranes and realizing some uh, oily and water ideal interface for controlling uh, the transformation of some o oily compounds in uh, and transfer in a water phase just using this kind of system and we will see some of these uh, example uh, oxidation of cyclohexane by in a specific uh, uh, tertiary butyl hydroperoxide at room temperature this again this uh, this kind of catalyst and that means this is a typical case in which you can uh, the two immiscible uh, phase are just separated by through the membrane. And in the membrane you have the you know, basically you can also eliminate the need for a solvent in which you can dissolve the system. So you can incorporate the iron uh, phthalocyanine with catalyst in a super cage of zeolite and the super incorporation of this zeolite in a PDMS membrane. And that's the, the one that uh, uh, work here and you just uh, can carry on the reaction. The same is done with uh, as I was mentioning with some uh, um, lipase, which is quite an interesting situation. In general, all the advantages of the system uh, at the end in the real life is the, the increasing of the yield of reversible reaction, of equilibrium limited reaction, due to the possibility, as I was mentioned before, of a continuous removal of one or more uh, products. 
That means we can also increase the selectivity of the system in this way. We can also have the coupling of two or more reactions. That means in some cases you can have an endothermic and exothermic reaction. You can have a dehydrogenation with endothermic, and you can combine a dehydrogenation with hydrogenation, which is normally exothermic, on uh, one phase and the other phase of your uh, membrane. Quite interesting, and there's a group in Delft University, for example, just uh, working on uh, this kind of uh, reactor configuration where you can just uh, use uh, the, the, the hydrogen, the heat supply from one step for the pushing on uh, the, the reaction of the endothermic uh, system. You can, uh, if you can do all these things, you can also restudy, you have to reanalyze all the reaction mechanism. I was mentioning that when you convert C ca carbon and uh, oxygen, you have 4,000, 5,000 reaction. Now, the possibility to have different reaction mechanism, to, to, instead of uh, 4,000 make it two, three, for example, in principle exist. That's why when we are using the kinetic expression of existing uh, uh, reaction from the literature, uh, that people have been studying using traditional reactors, we must be careful because some of the discrepancy that, for example, I was showing before, can be done to different reaction mechanisms. We have to restudy all the kinetic aspect of your reaction. And maybe instead of the 4,000 that were characterized in the previous one, a total different mechanism can be present. So we have to check this. So the modification reaction mechanism by the removal of main of the principal or secondary product by means of appropriate configuration of the catalytic membranes is a possibility and in some cases unexpected, in some cases you can decide to do something in this direction. Uh, higher resin time can increase the product removal. You can operate normally in many situations at much lower temperature compared to the one that you are supposed to use in traditional reactors. And that's also quite interesting area where people are working today. The fact that you can supply the reactants in under very controlled uh, uh, situation and uh, can just give you an overall uh, possibility to have a control partial oxidation, etc. So this is uh, all interesting uh, uh, properties. However, as always, we have a limitation. And the limitation is the fact that membranes have a cost compared to uh, beads or powders or pellets or this, the, the previous configuration. So this cost in some cases has to be considered if the benefits are not uh, significant. The membrane itself not only uh, has to be produced and designed in an appropriate way, but they normally have a lifetime which can be shorter than the lifetime of the traditional uh, pellets or, or, or uh, powders. And just uh, discussing, there are some technical difficulty. When I was talking before about perovskite, I told you perovskite work can be activated, this uh, transport across, at a very high temperature, 800, 900. If you have to build up a module with perovskite tube inside, the problem of the sealing, that means probably how to block the membranes in the vessel, etc., has been issue number one, not easy. If you have to operate, so you have to very expensive material and you can break your membranes because the, 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 the mechanical properties are changing because of the, 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 the transformation at this temperature of one compound compound in another one and the different the expansion of one metal is different from the other. So this, there is a lot of uh, some difficulty that has to be uh, considered and that can be uh, changed. Uh, that's why also sometimes today there is a lot of uh, work on trying to understand and to anticipate the behavior of this reaction. I showed you already before some modeling that we are testing to predict if it makes sense and it's quite interesting to use uh, the catalytic membrane reactors compared to traditional one before investing a lot of money to realize uh, the system because this system uh, has basically a cost. The decision of using inorganic or organic is obvious and is very much related to the kind of reaction you are studying. So the, the point is that uh, uh, a lot of people mention that this is the case only for inorganic. You can use the polymeric membrane very easily. Most part of the work that you find in the literature, uh, in this uh, area, uh, inorganic membranes are sometimes more present than uh, polymeric ones. But 
we will show you some example of uh, quite interesting catalysts working at room temperature. That means also reaction that normally work at uh, 20, 30 degrees can be just redesigned using uh, a system based on the polymeric membranes. But for sure in organic, in uh, water gas shift I was mentioning before, or in uh, steam reforming, etc., there is no choice. You have to use inorganic because no polymers can operate at uh, 500, 600 degrees. And the inorganic, they also have uh, quite chemi interesting chemical stability, thermal stability, um, uh, high resistance to high pressure. They are expensive, they are brittle. If they are fall down, etc., they, they, they break in a thousand pieces. Uh, normally, they have lower permeability and uh, not easy, as I was mentioned before. There's a specific case, uh, typical uh, not only for perovskite, but in general. Uh, when you have to make big modules, and we learned that in some uh, operation today we need uh, thousands and thousands of membranes together, etc., this is not a marginal problem. No, the, how to control the formation? We have a patent on years ago on how to seal some palladium membranes in rea reactors. So, and that is not easy because when you are just doing it normally, a lot of trouble. So we invented the system in which was possible to seal at a certain level where temperature were lower and to operate just in, in a different, far away from where the, the, the sealing was done in such a way that the system was, was working better. And we made a patent on this because this was important advantages compared to in a normal life. Uh, so the system that we have been discussing before or showing is this tube in tube a catalyst. And uh, where you have now in detail is that you can have uh, a ceramic support uh, coated eventually that can be a zeolite or coated with palladium that, uh, and uh, that is working in the uh, way I was mentioning this the catalyst is uh, present in between the external the vessel and the internal uh, uh, tube and uh, on the tube is uh, no, this is, uh, can be any, any, any material appropriate for the temperature and that is the way in which the system is going to work. But now the mechanisms that are controlling the system, nothing new. In principle, exactly what you have been studying already, because it depends from the kind of uh, uh, membranes you are using. Is a dense membrane? Is a microporous? Is a porous membrane? You can have a solution diffusion, for example, as, as we mentioned in the palladium membranes and any metal membrane with the mechanism of transfer very similar to the solubility diffusivity mechanism and, uh, or in polymeric membranes if we have dense polymeric membranes in some cases we have dense polymeric or if you are working with ceramic or zeolites or microporous you have molecular sieve just uh, size effect that zeolites at the external windows or if it's very large pore in some case you can have just viscous flow uh, in this case here you can have and when there is, a, is a molecular sieve you can have also here just sieving effect or Knudsen, remember, in which depending from the size of the pore compared to the size of the particles of the feet, you can have a Knudsen or just a viscous flow. And uh, or true pore flow model, in the zeolite membranes, micropore polymeric membrane in enzyme loaded membrane reactor, that's what we call this uh, true pore. Uh, in the porous membrane, Again, the transport properties are very much related to the morphology, and so we have to understand which kind of uh, phenomena, the one that we've been studying already in the, the traditional polymeric membranes, and depending from the pore size and the, the size of the molecules, we will have Knudsen, molecular diffusion, <coughs> viscous flow, or surface diffusion. We can have an interaction of the particles on the wall of these uh, membranes and that can be, can be present or capillary condensation sometimes people are neglecting that can be present or just molecular sieving normally the deviation I will show you before in the real life I show you that um, we make modeling and uh, we make a compare and we disagree in our experimental results with the traditional one is due to the fact that uh, not a single uh, model normally is working but you can have a combination of more than one. You can have molecular diffusion uh, combined with surface diffusion and the Knudsen flow. And so when you write your uh, modeling, uh, it's a little bit more tricky than expected. 
So we have to know and to check, make your experiment, check again, etc. Remember that normally in kinetics, in uh, this kind of uh, study, very difficult to anticipate the results. As you saw, the me reaction mechanism is done experimentally. Is basically all today with huge computers, something can be done a little bit more because you can imagine a lot of different hypotheses. But uh, when we were students, all the you know, order of a reaction, that means to know if the, uh, the, 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 the conversion is related to the concentration of the feed number one at uh, exponent one, 1.5 or two, no way to, un to understand just uh, theoretically. The only way was to make the experiment, make some hypothesis, is the first order, is second order reaction, is the third order reaction, check if the experiment were consistent with one or uh, the, this hypothesis and uh, making some uh, going ahead. But if you were trying to anticipate, there was no way. Today, here is a little bit the same story. It's better you make your experiments and make some assumption which one of these uh, mechanisms is the most appropriate. Each one of these mechanisms has a different uh, property. In one case, there will be linear relationship with the driving force. The other case can be square root of the molecular weight, if it's a Knudsen, et cetera, et cetera. And you make the hypothesis, you check the results, and you know if you have been right or if you have to change the hypothesis, basically. Because not always is an easy system and one of those is prevalent. Uh, what we are talking about uh, is uh, here, viscous flow, Knudsen flow, when this, uh, this the interaction is uh, more significant, surface diffusion, that means particle can interact with the, with the wall, condensation, that means capillary condensation, that can in effect significant change also the selectivity. Uh, the motivation for using more and more polymeric that years ago were not used at all is that uh, today we are moving from high temperature reaction that were initially the one more uh, in interesting to more traditional reaction with new traditional catalysts. And I was mentioned there are new catalysts or quite interesting catalysts, very difficult to operate normally. Biocatalyst enzymes, for example, but not only polyoxymetalate, for example, the one that we, we have been working, that uh, were quite interesting but unstable and it's difficult to, uh, to, to, to handle them. This is the way we will see how to immobilize and exactly as the enzyme and to utilize this kind of catalyst that were interesting for making publication but not for real life in oxidation. Oxidation is one of the areas where we need catalyst and the day works now much better. And so the relatively low tem temperature in which you can operate with um, catalytic membrane are just uh, uh, in, uh, something that today is possible and uh, uh, much more than the in the past. You know, the today they are, they are for sure less resistant, but uh, in particularly if you are able to have uh, an, uh, a vision of what is going on, much more uh, uh, interest than the past. For example, that's a typical case, and we will discuss some example later on, of uh, these uh, po polymers, which is not the traditional uh, rubbery, uh, you know, PDMS or uh, CA, etc., but is amorphous perfluoropolymers that we have been discussing also in membrane distillation, etc., Iflon, this are quite interesting, and the cost of this can be payback easily from the fact that you are solving some big problem, particularly when there is chemical reaction. So the fluoropolymers are going to have not only a role as hydrophobic microporous membranes, but also a, a possible role in uh, membrane reactor system, uh, which are now the basic uh, uh, principle for realizing this kind of uh, system. First of all is uh, the choice of the material you want to use. For example, if we are talking about polymer, I was showing you before that the microenvironment in which you mobilize your catalyst uh, can have a significant influence on the catalyst behavior. This is a general phenomenon. When you're talking about the mixed matrix, keep in mind that today, uh, if you want to realize a new computer, a new, com new generation computer, they need a lot of system very similar because the chips, when you have this, uh, no, the, the memory, you have to, the chips are, you cannot handle, you have to create a scaffold, the scaffold very often are membranes. 
And now the influence of the environment in which the, your chips are going to be mobilized can be quite interesting in positive or in negative. You can uh, kill the performance of your chips or you can improve the performance depending on uh, the interaction of your uh, material with the environment. So it can be a question of hydrophobic, hydrophilic character, can be a question of electron as, you know, release on, or acceptance, etc., etc. So that is the good affinity for the catalyst in order to avoid catalyst leaching or have a good adhesion between polymer and catalyst. So it's the same that the discussion that we had with uh, this uh, mixed matrix and membrane. Chemical, mechanical, and all these uh, properties to be important. And obviously, the transport property has to be well understood. Remember that the fouling is always present in the system. So I was mentioning already that when I'm talking about gas, sometimes people neglect fouling is always present and also can be present in a system working not as a separator, but working as a reactors. Because you can have the interface change in the concentration of the sum of the reactants, sum of the component defeats, that can change completely the kinetic of the reaction. And that can be positive or negative depending from the situation. And uh, that can be m much more significant if you have a just the position of colloids, emulsion, etc. In some, in some case. And uh, to avoid this, you have to use the same technology that we've been using in any membrane operation. Turbulence promoters, corrugate membrane surface. You can uh, create some uh, no, artificial uh, no roughness on the membrane surface. And in some case, you just have no system which you can you know, corrugate. You can have a pulsing flow. That means just having a species moving. You can generate vortex. You can penetrate just uh, inducing a vortex in a, if you have a tubular system. And you can, instead of making just a plug flow, you can induce uh, a vortex at the entrance. And that will propagate for a certain distance. So if you have a short uh, uh, reactor, if you have a the length of the reactor is very important also from this point of view because you have entrance effect are always present and normally they induce uh, promotion. But that is uh, for um, if you have one meter only for the first uh, 20 centimeter. If you want to have more and you want to induce a vortex all along, you have to study carefully the system. And in some case, the energy necessary is uh, just uh, significant and payback you know, that just to make the system not interesting. Uh, in some cases, uh, when you already here is the two-phase flow. More and more today, one way to improve, and I think we mentioned already, uh, the performance is to have uh, this two-phase flow. That means you can uh, have bubbling. Of uh, if you have a liquid phase, you can just have uh, create at the bottom of your uh, reactors some uh, uh, air bubble, and they move in, and that's their movement is inducing. Uh, uh, turbulence or just mechanically remove something that you deposit. That can be just air bubbling. In some cases, can be just the micro emulsion, a little bit more strong than just uh, air. And so there is no coalescence. If you just have a nanoparticle that you just put on the membrane surface to remove any colloids and any, any mechanical uh, deposit. That's kind of something that also can be done depending from the interest of your system. Uh, the area where this kind of things like has been applied, and we will see many of those, are just uh, is very large and more and every day a new application, a new process are becoming of interest. Uh, some of you in this university are already working on the MBR, membrane bioreactors, that is treating the most part of the municipal water all around the world more and more. But uh, you can have a lot of uh, you know, new process uh, in uh, the food industry, quite significant, in, uh, in which also in food industry there's a lot of application here to simplify other membrane operation. Sometimes when your food is too uh, viscous and is not easy to concentrate, for example, using ultra filtration, etc., in most part the first step is you know, the kind of depectinization. And this depectinization means you are using some enzyme, pectinase, to decrease the viscosity, and this thing is going to utilize in membrane reactors. You integrate ultrafiltration with the function of this uh, uh, enzyme, the pectinase, for making a very appropriate optimized depectinization. That means you decrease the viscosity, and the separation is becoming much, much easier. Uh, a lot of these uh, 
production in the pharmaceutical industry today, I was mentioning already, the problem of an antiomeric composition is today very, very significant. Remember that in the past we have been uh, killing a lot of people and inducing a lot of uh, terrible disease of uh, malformation in a uh, baby in some country, India, typical case, just by it using some pharmaceutical in which the, uh, an antiomeric composition is not very well uh, controlled. At that time, no one was really guilty in the sense that no one really was, <laughs> was aware of the situation. Today, we are aware. And uh, the point is that when you have a lot of compounds are uh, uh, antiomeric compounds, you know what that means. Are species which are exactly the same, my hands, they are equal, apparently. They are not equal. They are an antiomeric composition because I cannot superimpose. No, the only way to superimpose is they are specular but not equal. This in nature is very important. The level for most part of amino acid and a lot of drugs that we are using, they appear in an antiomeric composition. And the species having a positive bioactive properties normally are only one of the two. And normally the level form, nature for some reason likes the, the level form, all the amino acid, the level form, the right form, at the best, don't give you any trouble. But in some case, they can give you big trouble because they have in some other interaction unexpected, unknown very often, and in the past these things were not happening. Today we synthesize these things, so you have new products coming and you have to test. So the separation of the, to, to increase what is called an antiomeric composition, having 99.9% .9 of the one of the two, the level four that we know the good one, and remove the other one is a very, very interesting final goal. That can be done with in membrane bioreactors. Some of the products you are buying uh, easily, that the ladies are using very often, everybody is using some anti-inflammatory compounds. Ibuprofen, to give you an example, ibuprofen is present in a lot of pills, etc., is produced in only starting from one uh, compound uh, that is produced through a membrane bioreactors, able to give you only the level form of the diltiazem, which is one of the precursor of the final uh, product at the end. But today, basically, all the production are going through membranes because we have to produce only one of the uh, enantiomers of interest for arriving to the uh, final product. That is a typical one example. Uh, these are the typical now configuration that you can realize. Also here, the, the, the reactors can be particularly the bioreactors can be done in different way, uh, and the largest uh, uh, the largest uh, se separation is uh, done here because you have a system in which you can also, for example, MBR. Very often, the MBR is nothing more than a traditional uh, biological system in which you integrate the biological transformation with an external uh, membrane operation. Uh, in this case, what you are doing here, you just uh, have this uh, conversion of some of the uh, products in the feed, in the waste, and uh, you combine this with ultrafiltration to separate continuously, as we saw before, one of the products and to send back eventually in the reactor what has not been converted, etc. So this is a kind of system in which you have an external membrane unit and uh, the bioreactor, traditional one. We have a lot of this application because that can be ultrafiltration, microfiltration. Today is becoming membrane nanofiltration, and in some cases, this is becoming membrane distillation, by the way. So, this is the way. The other way of doing is that when you have the biocatalyst that is not just uh, present in the normal reactors, but the biocatalyst is combined in the membrane system itself, and that can be combined in the reactors, as we saw before, or just uh, in the membrane, in the having a catalytic membranes. So this, these are two very different uh, systems. The integrated, this is what we call recirculated external membrane reactors. This is the integrated membrane reactors in which the membrane is a catalytic membrane. The, 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 the catalyst is just in here. And that can be entrapped in many different ways. This is another area of research 
how to immobilize your catalyst in the membrane system is uh, there are different ways of doing and the other one will be the one that you will invent in the next years because there's many other ways of doing. We had a patent in this system years ago where you're making this one, jellified on membrane. We were using ultrafiltration to ultrafilter protein solution with protein that was a catalytic activity enzyme and using this uh, no, understanding concentration polarization, we were arrived to the point to transform the protein in so from a solution to a gel. Gel that was forming a layer on the membrane surface. And this was a gel led, no, we were calling dynamically formed gel led <coughs> enzyme membranes. They were formed dynamically during the ultrafiltration and they were still keeping the catalytic activity. Eventually they were decreasing transmembrane flux so the thickness was supposed to be controlled, so you were able to uh, know how much uh, uh, protein was possible to, you know, to add in the solution to form a very, very thin layer on the surface, but that was uh, this uh, gel and you know, dynamically formed gel led membrane membranes were a long time back. Or you can just bound to the membranes, or you can entrap in the membrane pore. This is a very general one. For example, some of the milk, when you go in the supermarket, and also here in Korea, you buy milk that is very easy for your digestion. You know something, I never heard this? You can, you can buy here, we call, you know, this, uh, it's a special milk in which you, know, you have to eliminate uh, lactose, because lactose, people from India, from China, maybe also from Korea, I'm not aware, cannot eat too much cheese or cannot eat uh, uh, milk after uh, one or two years of age, senior people uh, don't digest because with time we, are we have lactose only when we are baby. And after a few months and years, this lactose is disappearing. So if you drink milk, you don't digest because it's full of lactose and all the lactose stay on your stomach. So doing this, if you want to drink milk at my age, you have to buy this milk which has been uh, treated in uh, enzyme membrane reactors where this lactase, which is the enzyme, in, uh, is uh, treating the lactose and separate lactose in glucose and galactose that is much easier for our digestion. But <laughs> if you want to have <coughs> just lactose, no way. 100% in Europe is done with membrane reactors where you immobilize uh, your, uh, this, uh, in the pore of the membranes, the <coughs> lactase, and you treat your milk and what is coming through is a milk with much less lactose than the original one, basically. So this is the end, but the, these are the most familiar uh, immobilization that we have been describing already 15 years ago, but today maybe there are more than this and the new one will come. Remember that there is another interesting area of development that people, uh, in which people are working and as you can see from uh, the reference, this is work that we have been doing a long time back, but are becoming more and more important. And uh, when you're talking about uh, uh, polymeric membranes and biocatalysts particularly, you have a limit normally on temperature because, as you know, enzyme protein uh, are related to our biosystem. And if you increase temperature more than 37, 40 degrees, etc., you have a fever in the system because the protein does not work anymore, they collapse, except when you have thermophilic material. Now, at industrial level, very often, you want to work uh, to operate temperature higher than 25, 30 degrees. You can increase, you can better control interfacial phenomena, a, lo a lot of these things are much better. Today, people are working on thermophilic microbial cell. And the way to utilize the thermophilic microbial cell is just making catalytic membranes that are running high temperature. Quite interesting because when you mobilize this is caldera, this is something that is coming from uh, vulcans. So you have here in the North of Korea or in Japan, there are similar things. This kind of caldariella acidophila or solfolobus sulfotaricus is growing and living uh, in the vulcans on Hertz or deep in the water. They are working sulfuric acid. They grow in sulfuric acid at very high temperature. If you are able to extract the enzyme from these things, you can realize a lot of interesting application. The way of doing is to extract the enzyme from this kind of uh, microbial cell and to make enzymatic membranes 
based on this by phase inversion, etc. Quite interesting. That's an area that uh, long time back was becoming of, you know, that, uh, we call the same cellular acetate membranes at that time. Today, is people are synthesizing thermophilic ma material or go in the vulcans to extract them for uh, application with lipase, for example, for a washing machine and so on, protease, uh, quite interesting. So that means uh, that uh, you have to use, uh, to find a way now, which kind of mechanism can be interesting for phase inversion and preparing these membranes. And that is one of the areas that is still uh, in progress and you have been learning, but uh, that is very similar to mixed matrix. That means instead of mobilizing uh, uh, titanium dioxide or uh, silica, you can immobilize uh, an enzyme or a catalyst of this kind of family. Uh, just to give you an example uh, how things are going, initially everything was uh, on lab scale. This was uh, all of fibers have been also in this case very, very uh, familiar, very traditional. Uh, we have in many cases uh, already pilot scale that was part of this uh, industrial production or production scale. All these two here are just the column with a catalytic membrane system. That means the traditional membranes can be polysulfone, polypropylene, PVDF, or what it is, where uh, your uh, enzyme, in this case, have been immobilized inside using a traditional uh, membrane uh, uh, mechanism for forming the membrane cell plus the catalyst. And the catalyst can be added during membrane formation or can be added at the end. For example, uh, uh, one of the way, the easy way that I was mentioning before the, for doing this is to have, uh, uh, no, most part of the ultrafiltration membranes are asymmetric, as you know. The way in which we are working on this uh, problem of the lactase is exactly using this kind of system in which what you do, you ultrafilter your uh, solution containing the uh, lactase on the, from the external side to the internal. If the, if the capillary membranes have the skin inside, you ultrafilter from the outside, which means that the solution is going in, in the porous support, the water, etc., is going through the membranes, the enzyme will be, in, you know, cannot go through the dense part of your asymmetric membrane, so they will be mobilized in the spongy part of the fibers. And they will not, once that you have all the spongy part charge, it's a certain percent of your protein, they will not move. It will take long, long time before back diffusion. Now, the mass transfer coefficients in the porous part is basically zero. And so there will be no release for uh, years or months. That's the easy way of doing, just by ultrafiltering across the uh, asymmetric uh, ultrafiltration membrane, choosing the right uh, direction. That means you have to operate in such a way that uh, the solution enter, something is going through, and the feed that you want to entrap inside will be immobilized in the spongy part. Easy way of doing is one of the form that has been utilized just for the, the, uh, the lipase. Okay, we can stop here, and now we have to see which are the, these are reactors, are not easy system, and uh, there is a lot of them all. If you Chemical engineers have a special course on uh, chemical reactors, which are complicated sometimes. You have to, to do exactly <coughs> the same work with uh, reactors, which is catalytic membrane reactors. And you have to do what you have to add to the system, that you have a system in which you have a permeation. In normal reactors, there is no permeation normally. Here you have a permeation, so you have to talk about permeability, permeance, and which is combined with immersion. So you, we have to write down uh, our, uh, our term of, uh, of uh, well, I don't know where they are. We will see next time. But anyway, you have to ch check the, the system and to realize how your reactors are working in the condition in which a membrane reactor is just uh, normally operating. Keep in mind that these are, uh, in some cases, becoming best available technology in some application. In some other one, not yet but there is a lot of uh, big investment in research to making this kind of reactors running and solving problem of energy, problem of uh, pollution, health, etc., etc. Okay? Good. Remember that we don't miss Friday, so Friday you can uh, play golf or go to play tennis, and we meet on Tuesday at uh, 2 in the afternoon, okay? In this, in this class, it seems to be available.